Hello and welcome to the Colon Cancer Awareness Webinar. My name is Tim, your WebEx producer, and I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. I would now like to introduce Donna Jacobs. Donna, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Let's Talk About Health, a community conversation. I am, as Tim said, Donna Jacobs, and I will moderate today's conversation. The University of Maryland Medical System's Let's Talk About Health series is designed to do a few things, to increase awareness about important health issues, to provide people with the tools they may need to maintain good health or to improve their individual health, and thirdly, to improve conversations that patients or community members may have with providers. As Tim also said, today's topic is colon cancer. Joining us today, let's go to the next slide, is Dr. Ivan Chua. Dr. Chua is a colon and rectal cancer surgeon. She treats a full range of cancerous and non-cancerous colorectal conditions. She has advanced training in colorectal surgery, including the latest minimally invasive techniques, which incorporate laparoscopic and robotic techniques, and a special focus on robotic colon resection. Dr. Chua is a Baltimore native. She attended St. Mary's College, where she majored in biology, and the State University of New York at Buffalo for medical school. She completed her medical residency at Tulane University and a colorectal fellowship at Orlando Regional Medical Center. Dr. Chua is double board certified, both in general surgery and colorectal surgery. She practices medicine at the University of Maryland St. Joseph's Medical Center in Towson, Maryland. What an amazing resume, and we're glad to have you, Dr. Chua, today. This is a virtual conversation, and I know many of you have joined us in the past, and if so, uh, you know that it is meant to be interactive. Therefore, as we proceed, please do type questions that you may have in the Q&A box while Dr. Chua is speaking. She will be very happy to address as many questions as time will allow today. Please um, ask questions that may be of general interest if you can. We will not be able, of course, to address questions that are related to individual concerns, in other words, medical diagnoses especially. And as Kim has said, the conversation, I mean, as Tim has said, sorry, the conversation is being recorded. So you will be able to see this recording again, replay it as many times as you like, and have access to Dr. Chua's slides in just a couple of days, and I will say more about that later. And with that, let's get going. Dr. Chu, I think we are ready to proceed, so if you will, please. Uh, let me, before we start, let me just say one more thing. We have utilized the Ask Me Three methodology in these programs, and they're really helpful to help advance conversations with your medical providers. So what is Ask Me Three? It's a program that suggests just three questions that you want to keep in mind and ask when you are talking to a medical provider. And they're really simple, three things. What is my problem? What do I need to do about it? And why is it important for me to do this? Oftentimes when we see a medical provider, we're nervous or there's lots of information and it's hard to remember everything that you're told. So if you think about these three questions, it provides a really nice bucket for you to be able to get the information that you need and to retain the information that you're given. All right, and with that, Dr. Chua, please. Hi, thank you so much. Um, well, thank you guys so much for allowing me to talk to you about colon cancer. Uh, it is a problem that is near and dear to my heart. Um, the reason why we're talking about it this month is that Colon Cancer Awareness Month is in March. Uh, starting in February of, 20, of 2000, um, it was actually turned into a uh, sort of a, a way to introduce um, colon cancer and screening techniques uh, to the American public um, and try to get the word out. So we can do the next slide. So first things first, I, I want to talk to you about a little bit of anatomy. So what is the colon? So when I talk to people, um, I like to envision the colon kind of at this picture on this slide. So uh, 
starting from your mouth, when we eat, uh, we eat food that goes down to your esophagus and into your stomach, uh, and then goes through many, many, many feet of small intestine, which basically helps absorb all kinds of nutrients in the food that we eat. And then when it hits the colon, otherwise known as the large intestine, um, it basically allows, uh, as the stool starts forming through the colon, to absorb water, absorb electrolytes, and basically form stool in the way that we all kind of recognize it. So the large intestine or the colon is about five or six feet. Um, it starts on the right side of your belly, goes across the top, uh, down to the left side, and into sort of a squiggle called the sigmoid colon, and into the rectum. The rectum is about six inches um, right before it goes into the toilet, basically. Um, and that basically is a storage facility for stool so that we can sort of recognize, oh, I have to go to the bathroom and I go to the bathroom. The anus is uh, the additional one to two centimeters uh, right at the end where we mainly have our sphincter muscle control. So colon and rectal cancer is basically uh, the formation of cancer in any part of the colon and the rectum. Well, we won't talk about anal cancer at this time, uh, right? Really, we'll, we'll focus really on colon and rectal cancer. So colon and rectal cancer is the third most common cancer in the United States. However, it is the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States for both women and men combined. Unfortunately, lung cancer is the number one killer. Uh, approximately 140,000 new cases of colon and rectal cancer will be diagnosed per year. So about 100,000 new cases of colon cancer and about 40,000 uh, new diagnoses of rectal cancer per year. Um, about 56,000 people will die from this disease this year. Uh, you can go to the next slide. What I think is really interesting uh, about colon cancer uh, in general is that although the majority of people who develop colon and rectal cancer are adults over the age of 50, uh, there's actually a disease, this can actually be a disease of younger people as well. So about 12% of those people uh, will actually be younger than age 50. So that basically equates to about 49 new cases of colon cancer in younger people um, Per day. So the general population uh, has a lifetime risk of about 5% to develop colon or rectal cancer in their lives. That's about 1 in 25 people in their lifetime who will develop colon or rectal cancer. There are some people who have a higher risk of developing colon and rectal cancer. Uh, these are mainly people who have had a history, a family history of colon or rectal cancer. Uh, so their mother, their sister, their uh, child. Um, have had colon and rectal cancer in the past, these people will have a 10 to 15 percent chance of developing colon and rectal cancer. Um, this can also be uh, an increased risk in patients with inflammatory bowel disease such as ulcerative colitis uh, or Crohn's disease. Uh, people who have uh, genetic mutations, which we'll discuss a little bit later, um, can also increase the risk of colon and rectal cancer to over 50 percent. Now, this last bullet basically says that colon and rectal cancer strikes men and women equally. This is sort of true, but sort of a little bit different. So colon and rectal cancer in men uh, tends to strike them a little bit more than women, about 4.4% uh, in men and 4.1% in women. Uh, the reason why it kind of shakes out to be equal is that Women tend to live longer uh, in general than men, and so over that time course, uh, colon and rectal cancer can affect both men and women fairly equally. You can go to the next slide. There is a disparity, um, a racial disparity in colon and rectal cancer. Uh, so particularly in the United States, uh, the uh, the African-American community has the highest incidence of colon and rectal cancer and mortality of any ethnic group in the United States. And this, is, this can be a very multifactorial reason. It's very complex, um, a very complex subject that we're still working on. Some of the uh, things that we're looking at are 
possibly decrease access to health care, possibly decrease access to screening methods, and also some socioeconomic factors. Um, although the incidences of colon rectal cancer are starting to get to more of an equal footing, we still see over 20% more incidence of colon rectal cancer in African Americans versus white Americans, as well as a really significant increase in mortality um, from people uh, of the African American um, ethnic group. 35% um, higher in African Americans versus white Americans. Um, next slide. So what are some of the symptoms that can be associated with colon rectal cancer? Well, it can be blood in or on the stool. So that could be even bright red blood uh, after bowel movement dripping in the toilet or on the um, toilet tissue. It can be darker stools, uh, which kind of indicates that the blood has sort of mixed in the stool a little bit uh, earlier in the GI tract and has sort of made your stools a little bit darker or black. You can also have changes in your bowel habit. Uh, that can be anything from constipation, uh, diarrhea, narrow stools, increased straining for stools, pain with stools. You can have general stomach discomfort, including bloating, fullness, cramps. You can develop vomiting. Um, you can develop a feeling that your bowels are difficult to pass or difficult to empty. Um, you can have frequency of gas pains. You can have weight loss for no apparent reason. You could be eating the same exact food with the same exact uh, exercise routine and then all of a sudden be losing you know, 10, 20, 30 pounds uh, without any knowledge of why. Um, you can also have a new feeling of tiredness or fatigue, and sometimes this is from can be from severe anemia, meaning uh, blood loss uh, slowly in your stool uh, over time. I think another important thing about symptoms is that early cancers and, and polyps uh, may be completely asymptomatic. That means you could feel completely normal, but also be developing colon cancer on the inside. And this is why it's so important to start screening, okay? Because early detection and intervention actually save lives. And I'm probably gonna say that a couple of times during this presentation, so that'll be sort of a mantra. I'll go ahead and change to the next slide. So first, we're gonna use an Ask Me Three. So, um, Say this is a patient coming into my office, and I actually hear this a lot in my office. So, doctor, I've noticed sometimes that I, when I have a bowel movement, there's some blood in the toilet bowl and on the toilet paper. I don't think I've been straining hard. It doesn't happen every time, but it has been going on for a few months. It's probably just hemorrhoids. Well, although it could be just hemorrhoids, I think anytime you've had rectal bleeding, especially um, or changes in your bowel habit that have been going on for several weeks to months and you need to sort of figure out why that's happening. Uh, it's important to, to talk to your physician or uh, your surgeon about um, why this is happening because sometimes you need an exam. Uh, and the reason is sometimes blood with bowel movements can be a sign of colon cancer. It's important to do this because Although people can have bleeding from a benign condition like hemorrhoids, it's really important to rule out any other causes of rectal bleeding like uh, undetected colon cancer. Go ahead and go on to the next slide. So can colon cancer be prevented? The answer is yes. And how do we do this? Well, like we had said before, early detection and treatment can cause, uh, can prevent colon cancer and colon cancer death. So the reason why this can be prevented is that polyp-related colon cancer, um, when caught early and removed, can prevent early colon cancer from developing. So what are polyps? So polyps are basically like little abnormal growths uh, along the lining, the inner lining of the colon and the rectum. So polyps, much like people, can be different shapes and sizes. So polyps, can be sort of what we call pedunculated, which means they're sort of 
a, like a lollipop on a stalk. Those can be removed very easily. They can be sort of like flat, uh, kind of carpet-like polyps. Those can also be removed. Um, they can be sort of very flat and almost difficult to see polyps called sessile polyps. Those can be a little bit more difficult to remove because those polyps tend to be a little bit deeper into the wall of the colon. But the idea is uh, by removing these polyps before they turn cancerous can prevent cancers from developing. Now, not every polyp can turn into cancer. Uh, you can have what we call precancerous polyps, uh, otherwise known as adenomas, which are sort of like precancer polyps. They are not cancer yet, but those are the polyps that can take up to 10 years uh, to turn into a cancer. Um, and the reason why we'd like to remove these colon polyps before they turn into cancer is that early detection of cancer uh, can really impart a, a big survival rate. So even if we are able to find an early cancer in a patient who uh, has to go through surgery, if the cancer is contained and, and very small and very early in its stages, five-year survival of those people uh, can be up to 90%. Now, as cancers continue to uh, grow and spread, that survival rate actually goes down. And so that's why we want to try to find cancers uh, before they, they start spreading and growing bigger. It's estimated about 40,000 lives a year could be saved through widespread adoption of screening and early treatment. So next slide. So who needs to be screened? Well, um, the American Cancer Society in 2018 uh, started lowering the age of screening from 50 to 45. Um, and this was actually just recently followed by the United States, United States Preventative Task Force, uh, who also lowered the recommendation of first screening to 45. And this is in everybody, even in the absence of symptoms or any additional risk, risk factors. This, age, this uh, age to first screening may be earlier in some people with genetic family uh, familial syndromes. So two of the most common ones that we talk about uh, can be something called familial adenomatous polyposis or FAP. What happens when people have F FAP is this is sort of a genetic mutation um, and it is what we call autosomal dominant, meaning uh, if one person in your family has it um, and then you're that person's child, the chance of you having that is extremely high because it's autosomal dominant. And what happens is uh, these people have a mutation such that you can have uh, a whole colon that is just carpeted with thousands and thousands of those polyps that we mentioned before. So not just one here, one there, but just a literal carpet of, of uh, polyps. Too many to remove. And so nearly every person who has FAP will develop colonorectal cancer during their lifetime, and most even before the age of 45. Other genetic sy syndromes include Lynch syndrome. So Lynch syndrome is basically a mismatch repair gene of our sort of uh, bookkeeping genes in our, in our colon. And what happens is sometimes you can develop errors in these mutations, and these people tend to have more uh, cancers in their family that are than, sort of normal than the average uh, family. 70% uh, of people with Lynch syndrome will develop colon cancer uh, by the age of 65. These cancers are also related to other cancers, such as uterine cancer, stomach cancer, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, and uh, ovarian cancer. Uh, not mentioned on this slide is People with inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, those people need to talk to their physicians about how often to be surveyed with uh, colonoscopy uh, because they are at a 50% higher risk of developing colon cancer. Go ahead to the next slide. So COVID. I know we're all sick of COVID. Um, and. Uh, I thought it would be important to mention the uh, ramifications with COVID-19 pandemic and, can and cancer screenings across the board. So 
This is sort of a slide uh, from the Journal of Oncology. And this slide in particular, um, on the sort of up and down part, it basically shows the uh, rates of colorectal cancer screening per 100,000 people. Um, and then on the bottom part, it basically shows the time from when the global pandemic started in March of 2020 to just into uh, May of 2020. So during that time when the entire world was locked down, uh, we weren't doing any screenings. We were doing uh, no elective cases. Uh, we found that screenings for cancer, including breast, colorectal cancer, and prostate, dropped significantly only in that, that small amount of time. So there was a deficit of 9.4 million screenings total with a deficit of 3.9 million colorectal screenings. Um, there was a slight sort of return uh, back to sort of normal uh, when things started opening up again, but we have never recovered from those missed screenings. Um, what's really important about this is there's an estimated 18,000 uh, colorectal cancers that were not diagnosed uh, were delayed or missed completely. Uh, go into the next slide. So how can we screen for colorectal cancer? Well, we, there's a number of different things that we can do. Uh, so we're going to talk about each one and the risks and the uh, pros and cons of each. So things that you may have heard of from your uh, primary care physicians or uh, other physicians um, would be something like a fecal occult blood testing, uh, DNA stool testing, double contrast barium enema, flexible sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, and also uh, CT colonography. At this, at this time, it's not necessarily recommended for mainstream screening, but it can be used in certain uh, specific situations. And it's also good to note that colorectal cancer screenings, uh, the costs are covered by Medicare and many commercial health plans. So the next one, please. So first we'll talk about sort of what we call the non-invasive screening methods. So this can include fecal occult blood testing. So this is a stool study. Um, we have fecal occult blood testing, which is also known as FOBT, as well as something called FIT. FIT is a fecal immunochemical test. So what's the difference between the two? So FOBT is basically um, something that basically identifies any type of blood uh, in your stool. So you have to collect about two samples from three consecutive bowel movements. Um, this is done at home. Uh, you mail the home collection cards, including according to the instructions, and you have to avoid drugs that can irritate the stomach, uh, like aspirin or NSAIDs or ibuprofen, uh, before collecting the stool, because this can cause bleeding um, that it's microscopic because of the irritation of the stomach uh, that can cause these FOBT tests to be positive. Additionally, interestingly about the FOBT test is because it just detects blood in your stool, uh, that also includes anything that you eat. So if you're eating sort of a go to uh, the steakhouse and get a steak, um, that can actually cause your test to be uh, positive. The FIT or the fecal immunochemical test uh, is basically specific to human hemoglobin, so human blood. So you don't have to necessarily um, stay off of certain dietary things with the FIT test, but you still have to avoid drugs that irritate your stomach uh, because that can cause bleeding and therefore cause a, a, you know, what we call a false positive, meaning it's not bleeding coming from a, a polyp or cancer um, in your stool. And that's something that has to be done on a yearly basis. Now, I'm sure you've heard uh, on the commercials about this new colorectal screening test uh, called a, a Cologuard or a DNA stool test. Um, this is a great modality. Um, here are the differences between the fecal occult blood testing and the uh, FIT is that the DNA stool test actually combines it with FIT as well. So it is trying to find um, any blood in your stool, but not just with FIT, the DNA actually targets abnormal cells 
that that can be shed into the stool by uh, malignant cancers. Um, you can only do this if you don't have any active rectal bleeding, inflammatory bowel disease, family history uh, of uh, colon or rectal cancer. Uh, this can only be really recommended in people who have absolutely asymptomatic uh, average risk. Um, the way you do it is uh, you'll get this order from your uh, primary care provider. Uh, you'll get a kit in the mail. Uh, there's a brush that's pro provided in the kit. And you basically provide a stool sample, use the brush um, to collect a little bit of that, and mail the kit back. So only one time, not two samples from three consecutive bowel movements, just once. Um, you do not have to, to stop any medications with this test because it's looking at DNA um, and not just blood. Um, but you do have to repeat this every three years. Um, please to the next one. So other studies that are not invasive uh, are, are radiology studies. So uh, sometimes you can use what's called a double contrast barium enema, which is basically using an x-ray, uh, which uses barium, which is basically something that you drink that line, lines the inside portion of the colon. And then they pump air through your bottom with a small uh, catheter. And what that happens is, uh, they take x-rays of this, and it sort of, uh, the barium kind of coats the inner lining of the colon uh, such that the radiologist can see if there are any large polyps in there. So pro, uh, there's no sedation needed. You can identify lesions in the entire colon. It's less expensive than colonoscopy. Con, you do have to do a laxative bowel prep, which most people say is the worst part about colonoscopy. Some people find the test to be uncomfortable because you are not sedated, and they do uh, basically puff up your colon full of air. Um, and then it does use a small amount of x-ray radiation. The next modality is called a CT colonography. So basically, uh, it's basically a, a CT scan is many, many, many x-rays uh, that can basically look all the way through the colon and then reconstruct it using 3D. Uh, computer programming. Uh, the pro to this is that you do not require sedation. It's compl it's non-invasive, um, and the entire bowel can be examined. Um, abnormal areas like adenomas or polyps can be detected. The cons of this is you require a bowel prep again to clean out the colon. Um, you have to also consider the exposure to radiation, uh, which may confer long-term risks. Um, CT colonography and double contrast barium enema uh, need to be repeated every five years. Um, so when you start thinking about CT colonography, uh, not just with one x-ray, but with multiple uh, x-rays kind of put together, can actually have long-term risk. And some of them may, may not be covered by health insurance plans. So next one, please. So this is just a little picture of what each looks like. So on the left, this is a double contrast barium enema. Um, it's just a single x-ray, and you can kind of see that the barium itself uh, sort of lines every little fold of the colon, and you're able to identify if there's any polyps or masses from this. And then the picture on the right is basically a CT reformatted uh, 3D image. So where the arrow sign is pointing is basically a little polyp uh, that's been identified on the CT colonography. So go to the next slide. Um, the next one uh, that people have talked about is called a flexible sigmoidoscopy. So this can be done in the clinic uh, without sedation. You do have to have a clear liquid diet to sort of uh, not form any more stool in your colon, and then several enemas to wash out the lower part of the uh, rectum and lower sigmoid colon. The cons is that it only evaluates about one-third to possibly one-half of the colon if you're able to get up to that area without too much discomfort. Patients often uh, don't really like this because you're not sedated. Um, it's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and again, if you are found to have any large polyps, uh, you basically are recommended to get a colonoscopy. 
So the next one. So with all the previous screening tests that we've talked about, non-invasive, uh, the Cologuard or the DNA screening, the FOBT, the uh, FIT test, the barium enema, the CT colonography, if any one of those tests is positive, the recommendation is you need to be followed up by a colonoscopy. So this picture uh, is, is a picture of an actual endoscopic evaluation, so colonoscopy. And what you can see here is you can see a polyp. And this is one of those polyps that is what we call pedunculated, so like a lollipop on a stalk. And so what you see uh, kind of in the bottom right of that picture is actually one of the ways we remove polyps. So that is actually uh, basically a wire on a loop that you lasso that polyp and you can actually divide that polyp off uh, at, the, at the base of that polyp. So really all that abnormal tissue you see at the top um, will be re removed and evaluated by the pathologist. Um, so go to the next slide. So what is colonoscopy? Well, colonoscopy we consider to be the sort of gold standard of colonorectal screening. Um, and so what does that entail? So the day before the procedure, you have to have a complete bowel prep. That means that you'll drink a, a pretty powerful laxative that will help uh, your whole entire colon to clean out. Uh, people basically have to sort of stick by their house the night before while they're prepping out their colon. You don't really want to be at work. You really don't want to be going out in a social environment uh, while you do your bowel prep. Um, but once you do that, uh, then you've already done all the hard work. During the procedure, you'll have a mild anesthetic to put you to sleep and make you comfortable. Uh, while you're asleep, uh, a thin flexible tube will be inserted uh, into your bottom and then uh, guided gently all the way through your colon to uh, the right side of the colon when the, where the colon starts. And this is also sort of where your appendix lives. And that's sort of our stop sign to say, okay, we're all the way at the beginning of the colon. Let's very slowly withdraw the colonoscopy um, scope and carefully look at all the walls of the colon as we basically exit the body. Any biopsies uh, can be done at that time if we see any areas of inflammation or abnormality. Um, any polyps that we see uh, that are pretty small and can be removed during this procedure. Uh, this is the most effective of all the available tests. We're able to identify small polyps and almost all large polyps in cancers. Um, this lowers the risk of developing and dying from colorectal cancer. Uh, there are risks. Um, this is the most in invasive of all the screening modalities, uh, but it's a very safe procedure. So of all comers, there's a very small risk of bleeding or a small risk of tear or perforation of the bowel wall. Uh, and this is about one out of every 1,000 people. This risk of injury can be higher in older people, um, in removal of uh, larger polyps. Uh, or people who have had uh, multiple abdominal surgery in the past, such that they may have more scar tissue, uh, causing the colon to be a little bit less floppy about going around. Go to the next slide. So what are some of the screening plans? So again, the age of uh, average age of uh, screening now starts at 45. And this should continue to at least 75 or 80. So in an average risk person with no family history um, and you have no evidence of polyps, you can be screened with colonoscopy every 10 years. Uh, the stool testing with FOBT or FIT can be done every year. The DNA stool test every three years. Um, the double contrast barium enema and CT colonography every five years and the flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years, plus or minus uh, a stool study to make sure there's no blood in your stool. Now, if you're found to have a few polyps uh, on your colon cancer screening on colonoscopy, uh, we do recommend repeat surveillance uh, with colonoscopy every three to five years. And I sort of liken this to weeding the garden. 
you want to make sure um, if the weeds are starting to grow in your garden, you remove them and you don't let those weeds overgrow. Well, the same thing is sort of the case with polyps. Uh, if you have a personal history of colonoractal cancer, your screening will be more frequent. Uh, if you have a family history of colon cancer, meaning mother, sister, child, uh, first three relatives, uh, then early screening should be recommended at age 40 or 10 years younger than the earliest diagnosis in your family. And we usually don't let you go every five, every 10 years. We usually uh, see it back every five years because you are at a higher risk uh, than the general population. I think it's important to note that um, the United States Preventative Task Force doesn't really recommend one test as better than the other for screening. Uh, they've actually noted that allowing people to have multiple different screening options actually gets people screen for colorectal cancer more frequently and more life saves. So the next slide. So this next is uh, Ask Me Three. So, doctor, during my first colonoscopy, they found a mass in my colon. They told me it looks like a cancer. They say it's too big to remove with a scope. They took biopsies, maybe a tattoo, and now I'm waiting for the doctor to call me back with the results. I am so afraid. So what's the problem? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a scary situation when someone tells you you most likely have a cancer. So what happens is when the endoscopist goes through the colon and they find a big mass that looks very suspiciously like a cancer, and the reason why we know this is it does not look like a normal part of the bowel. Sometimes these masses can be very large. Sometimes they can be bleeding. Um, oftentimes, if it looks like a cancer, uh, what they'll, they'll do is they'll take tiny little biopsies or pieces of that mass to send to the pathologist who will look under the microscope to confirm uh, the presence of cancer. So first things first, uh, you will, we will wait for the pathology results. Uh, and hopefully, because you're up to date with your screening colonoscopies, the cancer may be very early and very treatable. So what do you need to do? Number one, take a big deep breath, because it is scary. Um, we're here to help you. I would keep all of your appointments with your doctors, keep your appointments with any specialists or testing that have been ordered. And it also really helps to have a second set of ears with a trusted family friend uh, or uh, family member. Uh, because oftentimes it, it becomes very overwhelming such that the only thing you've heard is, I have a cancer and sort of your mind is already racing. So it's always kind of helpful to have another uh, family member or a friend to help listen. And why is it important? Well, keeping up with appointments and testings can get the, help, get the process moving smoothly and quickly. So as we said before, early detection and early treatment help save lives. So now you've had a colon cancer diagnosis, now what? So what we do, and, and I'll, I won't go into the details about um, really the, the nuts and bolts of uh, surgery itself, but sort of an overview. So first things first, uh, we wanna do what's called staging. We wanna see uh, how aggressive the cancer is and if it's spread anywhere. So your doctor will order a, a number of tests, including a CT scan of your chest, abdomen, and pelvis to, to evaluate for possible spread of cancer to the lungs or the liver. Uh, why to the lungs or the liver? Is that we found that colon or rectal cancer tends to metastasize or spread uh, primarily to the lungs or the liver first. And MRI or an ultrasound may be used to identify how deeply the tumor has grown into the surrounding tissues. This is mainly uh, performed for cancers of the lower rectum uh, because we really want to see, you know, how, how far out of the wall of the rectum has the cancer spread or, and if there are any lymph nodes in that area. Um, you'll also have a number of lab tests ordered. These are just blood tests. Uh, so a CBC to ensure that you're not anemic, meaning your, your blood levels are at a, a appropriate level. Uh, CMP, which is basically a complete metabolic profile, that shows us uh, how is your nutrition, how is your liver functioning, um, 
how are your kidneys functioning? Um, and then a CEA level. A CEA level is basically a colon cancer tumor marker that we follow. Uh, normal is less than five in non-smokers. Um, in some people with advanced colon cancer or colon cancer that has already spread, this number can be very high. And basically we use it as a, a treatment guideline to see how well you're doing after treatment and to ensure that your cancer has not returned. Next slide. So what are some of the stages of colon cancer? So we had kind of alluded to this uh, a little earlier. So stage one is the earliest stage cancer. This is where the cancer has invaded into, but not through the entire wall of the intestine. A stage two cancer has invaded through the entire wall of the intestine. A stage three cancer is where the cancer has involved the lymph nodes or any of the, the, the tiny draining uh, lymph nodes of that area. The pathologist will look under the microscope to see if there's any uh, involvement of those lymph nodes. And that doesn't, with a stage three cancer, it sort of doesn't uh, matter if the uh, cancer has invaded through the wall of the colon or not. Um, once you have any uh, lymph nodes that are positive, you're in that stage three category. Uh, stage four cancer is uh, the most deadly of the, the stages. This is when the cancer has metastasized or spread to distant organs. So the treatment of the disease um, depends on the, the disease stage. So earlier stages, one to three, are localized colorectal cancers and are generally treated with surgery um, with or without chemotherapy. Later stages, like stage four cancers, where the cancer has already spread to distant organs, uh, this is usually chemotherapy first and then sometimes surgery afterwards. And again, it's really important to know that when we catch cancers early, like in a stage one, 90% of people will still be alive uh, after five years. Whereas we start going into areas like a stage three cancer, uh, where the cancer has already spread into the lymph nodes, uh, those people generally have a lower um, survival rate of about 71% over the next five years. And then, of course, the worst is uh, stage four cancer, where the survival rate at five years is about 14%. So uh, I won't belabor uh, the intricacies of colorectal surgery, but uh, like I said, early cancers can be treated surgically um, and very well, especially if we are able to catch them early. So we can do surgery a number of different ways, uh, open laparotomy mm -hmm. surgery, uh, minimally invasive surgery, including laparoscopic surgery. This is where the surgery is performed um, under general anesthesia with uh, small cuts and cameras. And then advanced robotic surgery, which is very similar to laparoscopic surgery. Uh, but actually has a, a little bit of a more definition of the camera. Um, instead of two arms, you have four working arms uh, and, and, and things like that. So during the surgery, the cancerous part of the colon is removed as well as the lymph nodes that drain that area. So usually that will have uh, about a two to four day stay in the hospital, can be a little bit longer if you have other health problems or um, any issues with, uh, with surgery. The pathologist will look under the microscope uh, to see if the cancer has spread to the lymph nodes. If the cancer has spread to the lymph nodes, uh, then we will usually send you to our cancer doctor um, colleagues to talk about chemotherapy. Uh, most times the colon can be reconnected at the time of initial surgery, and sometimes a temporary or permanent ostomy may need to be formed during the surgery. An ostomy is where the surgeon uh, basically sews a, a part of, this, of the intestine uh, to the abdominal wall uh, where a bag would be worn and, and catch the stool that uh, comes through. Now, oftentimes uh, the, the stomach is temporary to let that area heal, but uh, occasionally that, air, that uh, stomach is permanent. It just depends on uh, you know, where the cancer is, how advanced it is, and how healthy the patient is. So the next, uh, ask me three. So I am terrified of developing colon cancer. What are some of the things I can do to proactively help prevent developing colon cancer? Um, 
So what's the problem? So as you know, colon cancer is the third most common cancer and second most deadly cancer in the United States. Um, although some cancers are due to genetic mutations, inflammatory bowel disease, and age, some cancers can be prevented with lifestyle adjustments. So what are some of the things that we can do to help um, prevent colon cancer? So things like eating a healthy diet, exercise, and getting early screening at the appropriate times can help. Um, and remember, I probably sound like a broken record, early detection of polyps with removal can prevent colon cancers from developing. So the next slide. So here are sort of six basic steps to lowering your risk of colon cancer. And these are basically behavioral modifications. So you can't change how old you are. You can't change who your family is. You can't change if you have inflammatory bowel disease. But these are some of the things that we can do to help lower the risk. So one, get your regular colorectal screening. So beginning at age 45 for all comers. Um, earlier, if you have a family history of colorectal cancer or colon polyps, and early if you have a personal history of another cancer or inflammatory bowel disease. There's great studies that suggest that a low-fat diet, meaning eating less fatty or processed foods, can help with uh, reduction of colon cancer. Eating a high-fiber diet, meaning 20 to 35 grams of fiber a day, this involves things like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, cereals, nuts, and beans. Eat foods with uh, a lot of folate in them. So things that have folate in them are like leafy green vegetables. And I, th I think what's very interesting about this is that there's a lot of current uh, work and research done right now about the, the colon microbiota. So the microbiota is basically the thousands of bacteria that inhabit your colon. And there are certain things that make those bacteria happy and some things that make those bacteria unhappy. So a diet that's full of processed foods, red meat, fatty meat, uh, fatty foods, it can actually cause uh, your risk of colon cancer to increase. Um, so your gut bacteria really love fiber, and so fruits, vegetables, whole grains are great for your colon. Don't drink excessive alcohol and don't smoke because those can both increase your risk of colon cancer. And there's actually some very, very good um, research right now about increasing the amount of exercise uh, to decrease your risk of colon cancer. So this is twofold. If you can get 20, uh, 30 minutes of uh, exercise three to four times a week, this can really dramatically lower your risk of colon cancer because it also lowers your risk of obesity, which is also a risk factor for colon cancer. And here are some inf informational links. Uh, the first one is the um, uh, colorectal um, surgeons sort of website uh, with a really great source of information. Uh, the second one is Colon Cancer Coalition, uh, which is sort of um, the group behind um, Get Your Rear in Gear and uh, Colon Cancer Awareness. Um, this, the last two links are from the American Cancer Society. And that particular last link is a really, really great uh, summary about colorectal cancer screening um, and things like that. And that's a really great 35-page uh, summary if you want to read that. Dr. Chua, thank you so much. That was amazing. What a huge amount of information. And there were several comments that were coming in about uh, making sure that people can see this information again and hear it. And I'll, I'll give a little bit about that. But a very succinctly told to us and such a font of information. Greatly appreciated. There are, someone said, wonderful, thank you. There are a series of questions. I want to get to some of them. It, and one person said it was really interesting to see all of the non-invasive procedures that are available. And they're not spoken about that much and went on to say that this is a topic people don't really want to talk about. They don't want to talk about colons. They don't want to talk about stool. Um, how can we, what can we do to take some of this stigma away or take away the angst that people have and, you know, that are causing them not to get screened? 
Of course. Well, I think that's why we're doing this talk. It's all about education. So, um, with March being sort of the national colorectal cancer awareness month, this is exactly opening up that conversation. Um, you know, this, I see this every day in my office. I see people who have blood in their stools who uh, are afraid of colonoscopy because they're afraid of what they may find. Uh, you know, the, the problem is, is um, without screening, uh, without detection of early cancers, we have turned a problem that is extremely treatable to something that can sometimes be very deadly. So I, I think that normalizing uh, screenings and um, if anything is offered to you that basically will get you screened for cancer, um, that's going to save lives, basically. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with colonoscopy first and you want to be screened another way, talk to your primary care provider about other things that you can do. Just with the knowledge that if that test is positive, it really needs to be followed by a colonoscopy because that can be both diagnostic and therapeutic, meaning removing small polyps or early cancers before they turn into a much bigger problem. That's great. I want to try to get in as many of these questions as possible, and we only have a few minutes left, so I'll consider this a lightning rod round if I can. Um, so, someone you mentioned again just now about blood in the stool, and is is that the same? So, the question is, blood in the stool or blood always on the toilet paper? Can you tell the difference from simply that with between hemorrhoids and indication of colon cancer? In other words, even if without a bowel movement, you see blood, do you assume it's hemorrhoids or should you get checked? I think you should get checked. Um, I see a lot of people who just assume it's their hemorrhoids. And unless you've had appropriate screening, um, you could be missing a, a real symptom of colon erectile cancer. And certainly, I, I deal with a lot of benign hemorrhoids as well, and it's really important to, to see uh, your primary care physician to get screened, and then uh, see a specialist like a colorectal uh, surgeon or a GI specialist um, once once you know that the the cancer risk is off the table. Right. And okay, so there are several questions here. Someone asked about efforts to combat mistrust and people's fears, and especially the uninsured and the underinsured. Again, as you said, this is one of the reasons we're doing this. Someone said, my mother passed from colon cancer, and I've had screenings four times since age 50. I'm now 68. Do I still need to continue screening? I think your answer was continue yes. to 75 or 80, especially with that family history. That's correct. With a, with a primary family uh, member who is your mom, uh, then yes, we, we continue to screen you every, fi or screen you every five years because you are a higher risk. Okay, let's see. I hadn't read this one before. I'm a 13-year-old survivor of colon cancer, stage four. It was found in a 13-year survivor, not 13-year-old. It was found in my first colonoscopy at age 53. Thank you for the presentations. Others don't give up hope if you're diagnosed. That's a real word of encouragement. You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, why is the, uh, what this word is, appendix cancer I had 11 years ago? never mentioned, but it is colorectal. Maybe that means something to you. Well, uh, sometimes the appendix is a little bit different. It's appendix. So, uh, sometimes with appendix uh, cancer, that's really a neuroendocrine cancer. Um, so it, it behaves a little bit differently than a uh, colorectal cancer, which is the cancer of the glands of the inner lining. So it behaves a little bit differently. And depending on uh, where the appendix uh, cancer was, if it was at the tip of the appendix, it was uh, larger than two centimeters, uh, et cetera. It's sort of treated a little bit differently. Okay, this said appendix, so it's appendix. Okay. Um, do probiotics have any effect on fighting colon cancer? There's really no good research about that. It, it, the research for probiotics basically says it doesn't hurt you, but there's no convincing evidence that it can help you. You always hear about be aware and conscious of blood in the stool. So when you do a colonoscopy mm -hmm. and you're finding that there's an issue, are they also identifying other cancers that way? Oh, uh, well, the, a colonoscopy can really only identify 
colon cancer, rectal cancer, and anal cancer. Um, you can also, uh, if you are concerned about something like an inflammatory bowel disease or a colitis, you can do biopsies with colon uh, with colonoscopy, which is basically taking a little uh, tissue sample to see if there's inflammation consistent with uh, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Um, you can also, uh, as you go through the colon, if you're worried about one of those inflammatory bowel disease, you can actually go into uh, the the ileum, which is like the last part of the small bowel, um, because oftentimes things like Crohn's disease will affect the uh, terminal ileum, and you can take biopsies there too. And the last question says, I came in when Dr. Chu was talking about genetic causes. Mm -hmm. What are the most common environmental causes, and what's the typical time frame before it's diagnosed? Well, I mean, that's a tough question, right? So. Uh, Environmental right now, what they can tell are things like um, poor diet, so high fat diet, uh, processed foods, um, uh, inactivity, sedentary lifestyle, things like that. In terms of environmental, uh, you know, there's not a whole bunch of to data to suggest, you know, there's one thing that can cause a colon or rectal cancer versus another thing environmentally. Um, they do say that if you have a colon polyp, it can take about 10 years from a little polyp to turn into a cancer. Um, but I can't tell you about environmental, if, if you're worried about like pollution or um, access to some type of poisons, that kind of stuff, I, I really don't know anything about that. Okay. And as soon as I said last question, two more came in, so I'll just do <laughs> these really fast. Sure. Um, it says, can colon cancer runs in our family. Mm -hmm. My son recently found out that he has polyps on his gallbladder. Are these two connected? Uh, not connected. Not connected. All right. And is there a specific genetic test for colon cancer? We've talked about the family history being important. It's really and if so, Yeah. And if so how yeah. much are you an increased chance of cancer if you're shown to have the genetic marker? When well, you talked about that. Yeah, we talked about that. So the two that we really... Uh, are concerned about or really kind of focus on are things like uh, FAP um, and um, Lynch syndrome. Lynch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great. Okay. Um, next slide. I want to thank everyone. First, basically, like, say say you had, um, if you have a family member and they're, and they're positive for Lynch syndrome, you can have your other family members tested for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's important information. All right, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And it was said, thank you, especially Dr. Chua, for such an excellent presentation. These slides will be available to you, as well as any replay. You can go back as often as you like. If you go to our site at www.ums.org slash let's talk, you'll be able to see this in about 48 hours or so. We'll have this posted. As well, you can go back and look at any of the prior presentations that we've done in our series, in our communication and conversation series, and those topics are listed there as well. We do this the third Wednesday of each month. Next slide. And next month, um, I'm anticipating right now that it will be on post-traumatic stress syndrome. I've swizzled things around given the all that's going on in the world right now, and so we'll try to confirm that as soon as possible. It's April 20th, and if you signed up today and are listening, or you have um, received previous information, that will come to you automatically. And again, let me just say thank you, everyone, for joining us, and Dr. Chua especially, thank you for your time, attention, and such a clear and cogent presentation. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.